No cartoon character ever emerges fully formed. There's always a process of evolution. In the case of Pluto, the man most responsible for defining the character and giving him the personality we know and love was animator Norm Ferguson, known to his friends and colleagues as Fergie. We thought it would be fitting to pay tribute to the man behind the mutt. Animator Norm Ferguson, affectionately called Fergie by his friends at the Walt Disney Studios, was never inhibited by anatomy or drawing rules. An instinctive artist, he drew what felt right. It's none of my business, but is all this just to get an expression on the dog's face? Yeah, that's the idea. There was a lot of different kinds of Plutos that were drawn. Mm -hmm. And the first ones that uh, Fergie drew, mm -hmm. Norm Ferguson, uh, he had an uh, unusual way of drawing because he was essentially a cameraman. He was a cameraman at the Paul Terry studio and they were making silent animated films. And the story goes that one night uh, he was working late and there were some drawings missing. He came to a place where the, the character just disappeared in the middle of the scene. He looked all around and said, well, I better finish this up. They can't use it if he just stops there. So he animated enough to walk him out of the page. And the director came running around the next day and said, hey, who did those drawings? They're the best thing in the picture. And voila, you know, an animator was born. Fergie was born on September 2nd, 1902, to a Scottish father and Irish mother in Brooklyn, New York. He attended a stenography and typing school in Brooklyn, and then the Pratt Institute, where he studied commercial art. In 1920, he decided to pursue a career in the up-and-coming animation medium, and quickly won a job at Paul Terry's Fables Pictures Incorporated. By the time he got to Disney in 1929, he was a very experienced New York animator. And this is like one year after Mickey Mouse was created. He served as animator on more than 75 shorts, including The Chain Gang, Orphan's Benefit, and the Academy Award-winning Three Little Pigs. Norm Ferguson was a master of broad comedy and an early experimenter with thinking characters. He gave them feelings and motivations that audiences could identify with. His animation was more than just a collection of gags. The funny thing about Norm Ferguson is animators in, from the old days say this, that he really wasn't a great draftsman. He was a brilliant actor. Just the insight he, he had into what Pluto was going through when he got, got stuck on that flypaper. Those were human emotions put onto a dog. It was just amazing. Fergie's approach to animation was in sync with Walt's ideas about the medium and his feeling for storytelling. Ferguson was a natural performer. He made up for his lack of formal art training with a sense of showmanship. Ferguson's sense of drama and comic timing was inspired by the old vaudeville comedians he'd seen as a youngster. One character trait he copied from them was to have his characters look directly at the audience to show how they were feeling at a crucial moment. He was always striving to have his characters express real emotions. He was the animator of the Big Bad Wolf in The Three Little Pigs, and it's kind of a vaudeville theatrical wolf. Well, they're too smart for me! And it also translates into the other villains that he did later. In the feature Snow White, he was responsible for uh, the Wicked Witch. After she turns into the hag, she does this very hammy performance, which was actually based on Lionel Barrymore. When he animated the fox and the cat in Pinocchio, that's a vaudeville team, if ever there was one. A wooden boy! Ferguson balanced the fox's cunning with the cat's slapstick. He worked with the character's own flaws, turning them into a pair of lovable bad guys instead of outright villains. These were the kind of characters that Fergie understood and loved to draw. Don't be crude. Ferguson was a very intelligent person. He figured out technical ways that made characters more lifelike. A technique which Ferguson took to a new level was called overlapping action, in which parts of a character's body move at different times and speeds. In one of Ferguson's first jobs at Disney, the Silly Symphony Frolicking Fish, a chorus line of fish performs a very fluid dance. Some part of the fish is always in motion, overlapping with other parts also in motion. By never allowing the whole body to come to a stop, the illusion of realistic movement was achieved. This was just what Walt wanted his films to do, and he made the other animators at the studio look at that scene over and over again. Norman Ferguson worked with a, a group of 
up-and-coming animators at Disney who in their own way were trying to innovate. They looked to each other for support and for information. And they were always sharing information at that early studio at Disney's on Hyperion Avenue in, in Hollywood. It was a sort of a, like a little, uh, you know, tight enclosure where four of them would work in a room at the same time. Much to Fergie's amusement, his younger colleagues would study his drawings and try to copy the timings in his exposure sheets in an effort to learn just how he did it. You know, he, his background was in accounting. So he had sometimes the most complicated exposure sheets of any of the animators. Now, exposure sheets are charts that animators use, you know, how many uh, frames it'll take for each word or each action. And sometimes he would take drawings from other scenes and write them in. He had a very interesting mind figuring out how to maximize everything that he had in terms of drawings, in terms of timing. Really a, a fantastic animator. Sam Lesk or Freddie Moore, mm -hmm or the other two best animators at that time. Pam Lusk, that's what, he had to be perfect in everything to get what he was trying to get. Mm -hmm. Fergie was quite different. He had an interesting way of animating that I hadn't seen by anyone else. He would make sketches of where the character would be, but it'd just be a lima being here, and the head would be here, but no face on it, and the tail would be here, and then the legs. And he'd make that very crude. His drawings were famously called Fergie Ruffs. And well, he'd show it to Walt. And Walt would say, well, uh, aren't you going to put this in here? I thought you were going to do this over here. And <laughs> Fergie would say, well, yeah, I want to be sure you liked it. Walt liked this technique because it allowed him to see quickly how his ideas about a character's actions were working. If he didn't like it or changed his mind, hours or even days of tightly drawn work wouldn't have been wasted. Ferguson had a number of assistants. I think when he first came to the studio, he had like three assistants when he was working on the shorts. And then a young man named John Lounsbury came along who had terrific draftsmanship abilities. Ferguson quickly became his mentor. He was more than an assistant. They really collaborated. Lounsbury learned the more advanced skills that Ferky had developed over the years, such as broad gestures that emphasized an action, and squash and stretch, which gave the characters weight and volume. He worked closely with Fergie on Snow White, Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Dumbo. His superior art school training combined with all he had learned from his mentor to create a strong style. Lounsbury, the student, surpassed his teacher. You know, as other artists came to the studio, younger artists, uh, including the group that became later known as the Nine Old Men, they came from uh, uh, academic backgrounds, art schools. They could draw like nobody's business, and they were, you know, from the get-go, great draftsmen. So they took the innovations that were being created by people like Norman Ferguson and took them further into the features and lasted there for about 40 years. Ferguson was moved away from his beloved drawing table into supervisory roles. Walt may have wanted Fergie to pass his skills on to the younger animators, but it may also have been a way to make use of an artist whose drawing ability was out of tune with the new styles. Ferguson still was valuable in terms of his instincts, his ability to act, you know, or make his characters act. Fergie went on to serve as sequence director on such classics as Fantasia and Dumbo production supervisor on Saludos Amigos, production supervisor and director on The Three Caballeros, and directing animator on Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan. By that time, he really felt himself that uh, animation, as Disney was doing it at that time, had passed him by. Fergie left the studio in 1953. On November 2nd, 1957, Norm Ferguson died in Los Angeles. He uh, really taught our generation of animators not to only focus on drawings. Drawing isn't the only thing. You need to go further and just go for the raw emotion of the, of the character. I think Norm Ferguson taught us that more than anyone. Ferguson's greatest legacy is the uh, innovations that he brought to Disney Animation that made it what it is today, or what it became, which was truly an illusion of life. Wow.